I like words. Interesting sounding words, colorful or curious words, words that roll around in your mouth or off of your tongue as you pronounce them. Words like kerfuffle, for example. A kerfuffle is a commotion, a fuss, a disturbance, a mess, but why would you use any of those words when there's an opportunity to say the word kerfuffle? It's an old Scots Gaelic word taken from the root car, which means to twist or to bend, and the verb fuffle, which means to throw into disorder. So when things have become bent or twisted into disorder or conflict, you have yourself a kerfuffle. And that is what Paul is writing about in our text from Philippians for this morning. The church at Philippi, a church with which Paul has had a long and deep and affectionate relationship, is in the midst of a major kerfuffle. Things have become twisted into conflict. And while we're not provided with details, we can tease out a bit from Paul's letter. The first thing that we can know about the conflict is that it's not a small matter, no mere tit or spat. Why do we know this? Well, Paul writes his letter to the Philippians from prison. Perhaps as far away as Rome, a journey of six weeks to three months in length. Folks in the ancient world didn't just pick up a phone or send a text. News spread by couriers carrying messages or letters. So the conflict at Philippi is significant enough for news to have reached Paul across both time and distance. The storm didn't just blow up one day and blow over the next. Another way that we can know that this conflict, this tension, has legs, so to speak, is that Paul, in writing to the church, doesn't mention what the conflict is. And that means that everyone in the community he's writing to already knows what the conflict is about. The disagreement itself has become an actor in the community's story. And the third clue that the text gives us is that the conflict starts at the top, among the leadership of the congregation. Two women who worked alongside Paul in the ministry of the church. Paul describes Euodia and Syntyche as struggling beside him in the work of the gospel. They aren't newcomers. They aren't peripheral members. These are women of influence and commitment, perhaps even charter members of the Philippian congregation. So add up those ingredients. An ongoing conflict. A very public tension that everybody knows about. A conflict with named leaders, Team Euodia and Team Syntyche, what you have is entrenched factionalism, a division, a kerfuffle. Now the way that Paul addresses the conflict is instructive. He does not treat the division as a private matter, as we so often tend to do in such cases. He doesn't reach out to the two women individually as if to broker a backroom truce or to spackle over the cracks in the relationship. The division is public, so Paul addresses it publicly in a letter to be read in a gathering of the Philippian congregation. He first reminds the congregation that they are dear to him. My sisters and my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, or my victory wreath, my highest accomplishment. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Paul is pouring his heart out onto the page here. You are beyond dear to me, all of you. 
And then Paul names the team captains, Euodia and Syntyche. Names them, but does not shame them. I urge, I entreat, I exhort Euodia, and I urge, I entreat, I exhort Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. If the leaders of the conflict will work together, the whole congregation will come back together. Paul takes no sides, assigns no blame, but he reminds them of what is of higher importance. They have allowed themselves to be about the work of division. They have for too long made disagreement their shared mission. Their conflict has been more important to them in the community of the church itself. It's all about me. You're with me or you're against me. And in calling them to be of the same mind in the Lord, Paul is urging them, set your lesser personal agendas aside in favor of a larger agenda, the kingdom. You don't have to agree on everything. Just come together in one thing. Just keep the main thing the main thing. And how do you do that? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, Paul writes. Two observations here. One is, go back and note Paul's repeated use of the phrase, in the Lord throughout our passage. Stand firm in the Lord. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is near. It is as if to say, you have a larger allegiance. There is no team Euodia or team Syntyche. There is only the Lord's team. The second observation. Rejoice always. It sounds simple. But when you're rejoicing, you cannot be outraged. When you are smiling, you cannot scowl. Go ahead and try it. When you are united in singing and in celebration, you cannot be fractured or factionalized. So rejoice always. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, Paul continues. Not your toughness, not your strength, not your self righteous anger. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. A soft word turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger, Proverbs 15.1 reminds us. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which is to say a peace that we cannot manufacture or grasp for ourselves, because if we can't understand it, how can we begin to attain it? We'll guard your hearts and minds. We'll keep them safe. We'll hold them secure in Jesus Christ. There's a Warren Zevon lyric that sums up what Paul is saying here. What Paul is saying is, you're a whole different person when you're scared. Defensive, possessive, suspicious, combative. So do not worry about anything. Do not be afraid. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds and keep you from falling into division or error. Finally, beloved, all rights. Whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, 
whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Or actually, take account of these things, the Greek says. Take account. If you're going to keep ledgers, don't add up slights or injustices, add up what is true. Keep records of what is pleasing or commendable. Make notes of what is worthy of praise. Keep doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the peace of God will be with you. Taken as a whole, our scripture lesson in Philippians 4, 1 through 9, amounts to Paul using his full power of persuasion to call upon the members of the congregation to be their best selves in service of the larger body. You're behaving as if you must burn the church down in order to save it, Paul warns. Set your eyes and your hearts upon a greater good. When I worked in damage control in the Navy, we learned about the fire triangle. For a fire to exist, it needs three things. Fuel, and oxygen, and heat. Remove one, any one of those things, and the fire cannot continue to burn. Paul is trying to suck the oxygen out of this conflict, to deprive it of fuel so that it cannot burn. And he holds the members of the congregation and particularly their leaders accountable for thinking, and speaking, and behaving in ways that will make them a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. What they think upon, what they take account of, will determine whether they find unity in Christ or disunity in conflict. Now in 27 years of ministry, I have never before preached from this passage. Every time it's come up in the lectionary, I've looked the other way or preached a different sermon. I just couldn't find the relevance in a 2,000-year-old church squabble. But something in the passage resonated with me now. Perhaps it's warning against letting factionalism and division win the day. Perhaps it's warning that our worst impulses will never bring the best results. Perhaps it's a reminder that as a Christian, I am ever and always called to be and to live and to respond in Christ. Do not permit Euodia and Syntyche to make the church's future about them, Paul writes. You're a part of something larger and something lasting. You're a part of a community, a part of a union. Focus upon what unites you. Be accountable for your own behavior. Live your faith. Let the peace of God guard your words, your actions, your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. But do not contribute to discord. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And if it isn't true, or honorable, or just, or pure, or commendable, if it's unworthy of praise, then show it the door. Do not give it the time of day, give it no oxygen. You are called to something higher and better. And that is a message that's worthy for our day worthy of hearing by the members of any church that finds itself given over to conflict, 
worthy of hearing by the citizens of a nation that finds itself given over to factionalism and ugliness and the intentional sowing of seeds of division and discord. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Turn that cheek. Edit that Facebook post. Don't share that meme. Take the high road. Be your best self. Don't sink to ugliness. Rise above rancor. Rejoice always in the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May our every kerfuffle become kaput. We are called instead to heal.